header. So we have uh, Ken, Kadama, and Dario who are going to uh, give us a historical perspective first by Ken and then a future trends um, by Dario about uh, anisotropy correction for inclination shallowing. So Ken, you can share your screen and go ahead. Oh, your mic though, you need to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, I teach like this for the last year. <laughs> I never remember to unmute myself. The students love it. Um, so I've been asked to give a historical perspective of the uh, anisotropy correction for inclination shallowing. This, of course, is the cover of the book I wrote. And I go over the historical perspective a bit in that book. Uh, this painting done by my wife of some red rocks containing, obviously, hematite in Utah. So let me go on. It, this started in the 80s of, with work originally by Gwen Anson, one of my students in the 80s. And what we were interested in is doing very controlled laboratory compaction experiments. Uh, we used a device um, designed by Hamano and where you drip water very slowly into a tank, which loads a sample shown in the upper left here with its poor stones and filter paper around it. The idea, of course, is you don't want to compact the sample too fast. You want to compact it at the rate that the water can escape from this very low permeability clay, uh, low permeability clay rich sample. Uh, and when, when Gwen did this, we saw inclination shallowing. A student of mine, Gay Deemer, uh, worked on this too using the same device. And, what I want to show you in these laboratory uh, compaction experiments that we did, that, that the inclination shallowing is a product of the development of the fabric of the, of the sample as the sample is compacted. What we see here in the upper right is the change of porosity with pressure, increasing pressure off here. And what you can see is there is this, this very characteristic behavior, which other people working on compaction of sediments saw, which is at low pressures, you see a rapid decrease in porosity, and then a, there's a break in slope, and then a very slow decrease in porosity. This is the inclination shallowing, and Gay Deemer worked on this with different initial inclinations around 30 all the way up to 80 degrees steep inclination. We saw the same type of behavior where we saw a loss of inclination at, at, at the same time and a break in slope in the behavior at the same time we saw the changes in porosity. Uh, Weiwei Sun went on and worked on with the same device. We, those original experiments I just showed you were done with artificial sediment with kaolinite matrix and we added a secular magnetite about a half micron long. Uh, so clearly it was uniaxial type magnetite. We added in here natural sediments, which were collected off the coast of Oregon, marine sediments. Uh, these are PRM, PARM spectra. The acicular magnetite has higher coercivity shown by this curve. The natural marine sediments have coarser magnetic grains and lower coercivities here. And we also compacted a mixture of sediments with a mixture of the natural and the acicular magnetite. Uh, so we could target different magnetic grain sizes with different partial ARMs, which is an important point uh, that we need to get through here. Over here on the right, we have the AAR. I just stick to three letters. This is what everybody else calls AARM, the anisotropy of anhistoretic remnants. Um, and what we see are compaction fabrics for each of these sediments, either the artificial acicular magnetite fabric or the natural marine uh, sediments. And we see, it's hard to see, but we have minimum axes perpendicular to the bedding plane and intermediate and maximum axes lying in the, in the bedding plane. So we see in these laboratory experiments, we see uh, 
strong indication of what we would call a compaction fabric. Weiwei Hassan also did some very painstaking work where we dried the sediment at different amounts of compaction. On the upper left, it's maybe hard to see, but this is uh, really high water content, hardly compacted at all. Sediment in the bottom right is about as compacted as you could see. And then we were able to dry these by taking the, sa the samples to the, putting carbon dioxide actually in the pore spaces and, and taking to the triple point of CO2 and drying without any surface tension effects and looking at the dried, we impregnated with them epoxy, uh, dried sediments at different um, SEM photographs of sediments at different amounts of compaction. And you can see that a, a, uh, a fabric is developing in, in the clay fabric. Over here, this is the percent anisotropy as a function of pressure for kaolinite or for the natural sediment. And what I want you to see is that the magnetic fabric as measured by the partial ARM is developing with the same kind of break and slope behavior that we saw for an inclination shallowing and for the porosity decrease. So what we're, what we're building the case is that this clay fabric is developing in the same way and the inclination shallowing is following the same kind of behavior as the development of the fabric um, as, as the laboratory samples being compacted. And this led to a model that Wei Wei Sun and I came up with. Um, and that is over here, you can see just a graphical depiction. This is inclination shallowing or void ratio. And you can see that we have that break and slope behavior. Oops, sorry. And this over here is the increase in magnetic anisotropy. And we also did pole figure goniometry of the um, clay rich fabric to see the development of the clay fabric. They're all following the same behavior. The other important thing I'd like you to see in this picture is originally Gwen Anson and her original work on the uh, compaction experiments in the lab suggested there was an in electrostatic interaction between the magnetite particles and the clay fabric. And Wei Wei Sun was able actually to see a picture of this. This is a really high uh, void ratio, very high porosity, hardly compacted at all, maybe not compacted at all. And we actually see the acicular magnetite particles sticking to the clay particles with huge void ratios. At the time, the idea were as the, as the sediment compacted, the, the voids became smaller and smaller until they trapped the magnetite particles. And then the magnetite particles would be forced to move with the clay fabric. What we found instead was that the magnetite particles at very high porosities were already sticking to the clay particles, either by electrostatic forces or by van der Waals forces. And so these magnetite particles are following the development of the clay fabric from the very beginning. Uh, you don't have to wait for the pore spaces to get small enough to trap the particles. And again, here is a typical plot of the development of anisotropy uh, as pressure increased as the sediment compacted. So this led to the idea that the magnetic anisotropy, remnants anisotropy, could accurately reflect the change in the orientation of the magnetite particles and hence the development of the inclination shallowing. We were able to find evidence of this in the natural world too, not just in laboratory experiments. Uh, one of the things that I was doing at this time was working with students to look at the anomalously shallow inclinations up and down Western North America, which had been interpreted as due to ter terrain movement at that time. We wanted to investigate the possibility that this was an artifact of inclination shallowing due to compaction in these typically Cretaceous age marine sediments. A student of mine, Jordan Vaughn, worked on the perforata, Cretaceous perforata formation in Baja, California. 
And in this particular unit, we found suites of sites with different degrees of anisotropy developed. And you can see as you go from left to right, well-developed AMS and AAR, the anisotropy and hysteretic remnants. And over here, we see less developed fabric. If you look at these sites, the inclination of the well-developed fabric sites have shallower inclination than the, I'm sorry, than the um, sites with poorly developed fabric. In fact, if you use the inclination shallow and correction, uh, which I'll go to in a second, you will see that you can correct these sites and you end up with a inclination comparable to the sites with poorly developed fabric. So that leads us to the mathematical uh, correction. This was uh, published by Mike Jackson. And basically we're looking at, they used of course this equation from King, which shows the inclination shallowing is related to the tangent of the inclination. And this F factor between zero and one, it tells you the degree of inclination shallowing between the inclination you would expect for an accurate representation of the field and what you measure in the shallowed uh, sediments. Um, and it's a function as Mike and, and others pointed out and the co-authors pointed out of the ratio, of the minimum bulk anisotropy to the maximum. And this is also important to realize it's a factor of the individual particle anisotropy, the A factor. I'm not gonna talk about it, but Lisa and Dennis came up with their own way of getting at this F factor by looking at the elongation of the, um, the distribution, of the uh, directional distribution of the, of, the, of the remnants. So I don't want to eat into Dario's time. I realize time is short, but one thing that in Mike Jackson's uh, equation, he, um, he's looking at uh, magnetite typically, which has shape anisotropy, and you can model the individual particle anisotropy in terms of prolate ellipsoids. We want to look at the inclination shallowing of red beds, and of course that's hematite, and hematite has a microcrystalline anisotropy, and the, the magnetization tends to lie in the basal plane of the hematite particles, so you need to think about the individual particle anisotropy in terms of oblate spheroids and uh, Zadong Tan and I worked and we redid Mike Jackson's equation for F, the F factor. And this way, if you model the individual particle anisotropy in terms of oblate uh, ellipsoids. One of the problems with hematite, of course, is that it is really high coercivity, so it's hard to apply remnants anisotropy, you need to look at the remnants anisotropy of the characteristic remnants carrying grains. Um, in order to do that, Zadong Tong, looking at these uh, Cretaceous red beds that carried anomalously shallow inclinations in Central Asia, we did chemical demagnetization. And we isolated a, a characteristic remnants, which of course we verified by doing thermal demag, using chemical demagnetization and measured the AMS as we chemically demagnetized and looked at the fabric that was being removed by chemical demag at the same time the characteristic remnants was being isolated. We got a compaction fabric with minimums perpendicular to bedding and maximums intermediates lying in the bedding plane. One of the things that, and then of course you need to relate that AMS as Andreas pointed out, you need to relate it. And we use Stevenson's equations looking at the relationship between the AMS principal axes and the AIR, the anisotropy of isothermal remnants uh, here. And that way we could get an idea of the degree of the remnants anisotropy of those grains, which are, been isolated by chemical DMAG in the AMS. We didn't know the A factor. We didn't know the individual particle anisotropy. And so therefore, what Zadang Tan did was he looked at the theoretical curves for different size A factors and fit our data to it to get an idea of the correction. 
Dario came along and looked at red beds from Nova Scotia and did chemical DMAG and anisotropy of isothermal remnants, saw compaction fabrics in that, but also developed a way of actually independently directly measuring the A factor for the hematite. It's a little more difficult with hematite because it's 200 times less magnetic per unit volume than magnetite. So the typical way of doing it with the slurry um, and passing it past a magnet to separate out the magnetic grains doesn't work as well for hematite. You, uh, following Mark Decker's, we did a centrifuge to isolate the heavy, um, the heavy minerals out. And then we did the, the slurry thing past the magnet. And Dario was able to directly measure the um, A factor for the hematite. Finally, I'm going to end here, um, is that, as mentioned before, Andrea mentioned, you need to look at the, the complete tensor. A lot of Mike Jackson's equation assumes that the minimum axis is perpendicular bedding and the maximum axis lies in bedding. That's not always the case when you measure real rocks. And so you need, this was a, suggested by Bang on Kim, one of my students, you need to look at the inverse of the DRM tensor to correct the uh, magnetization to get back to the field inclination. And you can relate following Mike Jackson, you can relate that DRM tensor to the ARM that you measure, but you don't have to assume that the minimum axis is perpendicular to bedding. Um, and I think, that maybe at this point I should turn things over to Dario. Uh, I won't mention this, but I will mention it very quickly that we compared the EI technique to the anisotropy technique. We found good agreement in some cases. In some cases, the EI technique, the elongation inclination technique put forward by Dennis and by Lisa, uh, overcorrects, and I think that's because of unrecognized vertical axis rotations in some field areas. So I'm gonna end there and I'm gonna turn things over. I'm gonna pass the torch to Dario, okay? Yes, let's continue the journey and we'll take questions for Dario and Ken after, after Dario's finished his part of the talk. So hello, hopefully you will be able to see my screen now and uh, maybe also my cursor. Uh, let's see if I get to annotate here and spotlight. I get a pointer. Okay, so I'm gonna start from, sorry, my screen is not moving along right now. But I wanted to start from the inclination corrections uh, that uh, both Mike and uh, Mike Jackson and others and uh, Tan and Kodama had derived for, oh, here we go. Okay, for magnetite and hematite. And I wanted to make the point that uh, this year marks 30 anniversaries of the 30 anniversary of the inclination shallowing corrections. And I also wanted to point out that these equations for magnetite were derived by the two uh, sets of authors starting from different places, from different orientation distributions for the particles. And that's fairly remarkable. And what I will do in this talk is mostly focus on the hematite inclination corrections and on the challenges we have in uh, measuring the principal anisotropy axes, i.e. the fabrics for hematite and the individual particle anisotropies. And the challenges for hematite, as we know, is that the particles are typically very hard and they're difficult to saturate. Uh, the components typically have coercivities in excess of one Tesla, as we can see in fork diagrams and in a mixing. However, as uh, Andrew Roberts and co-workers have pointed out recently, hematite can also be very soft and have coercivities that are lower than 300 milliteslas. Right? And going back to some of the comments that Lisa had made, what well, we had performed are double IRM acquisition experiments, yet followed by AF demagnetization and also thermal demagnetization to really isolate the IRMs carried by the hematite. And we observed that most samples for the Shepardy formations and also for the Mochunk red beds are 
can be considered saturated above 4.75 uh, Teslas. And I want to caution about the risk of measuring anisotropy in unsaturated samples, because what typically is observed is that you do see the same orientation in the anisotropy principal axes, yet their magnitude will be different. And so you typically end up with more prolate fabrics, which will result, result in larger than expected inclination shallowing corrections. So the technique that I developed is this high field uh, AIRM uh, technique, uh, measuring or imply, uh, applying IRMs of five Teslas or five and a half Teslas in cases, and uh, following these by AF demagnetizations uh, to eliminate the contribution of magnetite, and also thermal demagnetization in uh, small temperature uh, steps to eliminate the contribution of goethite is present. And in some cases, I also uh, uh, HCL uh, acid leach the samples to remove the contribution of pigmentary hematite. And this was found to improve uh, better the fabric of the Shepardy formation red beds, where you can see a better clustering of the principal axis directions after acid leaching. And the same technique was applied for the more chunk formation without acid leaching. And of course, uh, again, uh, we managed to isolate pretty good uh, fabrics for this formation. Another technique that I developed uh, is the multi-specimen technique. And this is to really isolate the components carried by different grain sizes of hematite. And this technique owes a lot to Roberto Siqueira, who was a technician in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And he developed a technique to measure the anisotropy of magnetite from uh, ARMs applied in free orthogonal orientations and then AF stepwise demagnetized, all right? And from the vectors from the different demagnetization steps, he could uh, calculate by vector subtraction the tensor through those uh, demagnetization, for those demagnetization intervals as full vector IRMs. Now, readapting this to hematite means that we cannot AF demagnetize. We have to thermally demagnetize, and this will uh, uh, cause thermochemical alteration of the sample, which in turn means that we cannot apply IRMs to the same specimen. Uh, a, uh, IRMs, yes, <laughs> sorry. So here is where the free orthogonal specimens come in, which are magnetized along their z-axis of each specimen. These are drilled along the x, y, and z uh, directions of the larger sample. And so assuming that the sample is homogeneous and that the three cores are drilled perpendicularly, perpendicularly, then we can combine the vectors measured from the three specimens to calculate uh, the tensor difference um, uh, IRM anisotropies, right? And we can see when we do the thermal demagnetization, we can observe all of the components coming off with a larger component obtained for the higher unblocking temperature spectrum, which should correspond to the uh, specular hematite. Then a component between about 600 and the nail temperature, which can be attributed to uh, the pigment. And then everything below that could be a, a combination of the pigment and magnetite and possibly even graphite. And the results look very promising. Uh, this is the component carried for the pigment uh, separated between 600 and 670 degrees C. The specular hematite can be isolated between 670 and 690, at least in these experiments. And then we can also calculate the bulk total contribution for the hematite between 600 and 690. And this com uh, component can be compared directly to the high field AR technique from this, obtained from the same formation. And we can see that the results are very comparable. And in fact, it's the specular hematite fabric that dominates the fabric. Yes, there is some switching of the maximum and intermediate axes. And this is probably due because one, the fabric is oblate, but also maybe due to some non-perfect -per uh, perpendic perpendicularity <laughs> of, uh, of the cores drilled in the sample. But what I do want to point out is that both specimens do seem to agree with what expected with a magnetic lineation that reflects the orientation of the structural trend from where these samples were collected.
Moving on to measuring particle anisotropy, Ken already mentioned the magnetic extract technique. Uh, multiple measurements were made on different hematite formations, and I just want to point out the tight distribution of these determinations, and these will come into play later when I will talk about propagating the error for inclination corrections. And then there is the curve fitting technique of, uh, uh, that was again talk, discussed in uh, Kodama 2009 with the simplification of the corrections. Something I have been working on, and this borrows again from the eye correction technique, is to determine A from looking at the distribution of corrected directions and VGPs. And the idea is that depending on whether the rocks we are looking at average paleocycular variation, the corrected or original orientation of the directions and VGP should be circularly symmetric. And we can do, look, do that by looking at the intermediate over minimum uh, ratio of the principal components of the axis. And we can use, for example, the Bingham distribution, all right? So the correct A factor to use for a correction will result in a most symmetrical distribution. And the results um, look something like this. For the Shepardy formation, we obtain a minimum at, uh, for an A factor of 1.36. And this compares to a 1.39 A factor measured for the magnetic separate of the Shepa deformation. For the Deer Lake group, we obtain a minimum for A values ranging from 1.9 to 1.95, which is comparable to the magnetic extract of 1.99. Another beautiful example is from this data set of Huang and others. They measured the CHRM with an inclination of about 20 degrees. They corrected it with the eye technique. They corrected it to form by some 20 degrees, coming up to 40. They use Kodama's curve fitting technique, A factor 1.39, and they obtain an inclination corrected to the same value essentially as the eye technique. If we look at the distribution of directions, we obtain an A factor of 1.59, which is somewhat higher than the curve fitting technique, resulting in a smaller value of inclination correction. But when we look at the distribution of VGPs, then there's a very distinct minimum with corresponding to an A factor of 1.36, which is in very good agreement with the curve fitting technique and resulting in an identical and corrected inclination. So at this point, I want to move on to talking about the uh, error propagation through the correction, which has been a long standing point. Uh, the way we did this was to look at the distribution of corrected site means using an A factor of 1.38, which is the mean of all hematite uh, inclination, uh, A particle anisotropies. And when we do this, we obtain an alpha 95 circle of 7.8. But we also use the uncertainty around the determination of the A factor, and we use the standard deviation on the measurement of the fabric for each site. And if we propagate that through bootstrapping for the Shepard deformation, we obtain this variability, which results in a more elliptical distribution of the corrected site means. Uh, the variability on the, the correction corresponds to about 15% and results in the uncertainty becoming more elliptical and increasing by about one degree uh, along the long axis of the ellipse. Uh, notably, the corrected site mean, uh, inclination mean also steepens by a fraction of a degree here. So we thought it would be reasonable to apply this propagation of error to double the 15% error uncertainty to about 30%. And then we compare this 30% error propagation to no error propagation within the same Shepard deformation. And again, we see that the inclination becomes about 1.3 degrees steeper than without propagating the error. And the uncertainty along the long axis of degree also increases by just over one degree. So we are pretty confident that this uh, error propagation and 30% would be a good value to use for subsequent uh, uh, corrections. And so we apply it to different corrected rock formations. And the results are fairly consistent with about an added uncertainty of about one degree for each formation. So the main point being that the error propagation 
um, reveals that the correction does not increase the error substantially for the correction. And when we've done this, we can also start comparing results obtained by different techniques. And we can see that if we use the magnetic extract, this is again the shepherd deformation, which is my battle horse in inclination corrections. So the A factor obtained by the separate 1.39, we obtain a 30.1 degrees inclination correction, which is very similar to if we use the mean hematite value of 1.38. And again, it's very similar if we use the A factor determined by the distribution of corrected directions and VGPs. After error propagation also, the situation does not change substantially. And we can also now compare this to uh, results obtained from DEI technique. And in my experience, if the uh, number of samples is large enough, then the two techniques are highly comparable. And this is great because these rocks in particular are uh, carboniferous, so upper Paleozoic. So we are extending the validity of the eye technique to the Paleozoic. And moving away slightly from inclination corrections, the eye technique has also recently been used in assessing the reliability of sedimentary rocks. And this is absolutely great. Um, and I'm just cautioning that the distributions for applying the eye technique must be unadulterated. And what I mean by this is that we should not be applying cutoff angles and Tox and Kent talked about this in their 2004 paper. Uh, it was recently demonstrated again by Weiss et al in uh, 2001 in a very recent paper that adopts this technique. And, um, and uh, yes, so whenever you do apply inclination corrections, you want to make sure that you're looking at the distributions and these should not be modified in any way. Okay. I want to switch gears here and look at the effects of inclination shallowing corrections on estimates of relative paleo intensity. So it's been long recognized, and here is an example from Tox and Kent, experimental results from 1984. So there is definitely a field intensity dependence of the magnetization, but there's also a systematic field inclination dependency of the magnetization, where experiments conducted in shallow field inclinations are typically stronger than those obtained in vertical field inclinations. And this can also be replicated in, in other experiments. And we can see that the data obtained for the experiments match, agree with uh, the model fits through these data. And as we increase the inclination of the deposition field, uh, we don't have a symmetric switching between the horizontal components in blue and the vertical components in, in red, where we restore fully the magnetization of the vertical components in vertical fields. So this will lead to inclination shallowing, but also will lead to, uh, as, as observed, lower uh, magnetizations for experiments conducted in vertical fields or in natural cases for rocks deposited at high latitudes, right? So can we correct for this for inclination shallowing? And we can do this by borrowing from the technique of Kim and Kodama, 2004 again, who managed to correct the whole vector of the magnetization uh, and they did it to correct for slight deflections in the, um, uh, in the azimuth of the vector. And they assumed the unit, a unit vector here. But we can also use the free components to recalculate the magnitudes of the corrected vectors. And so the results look something like, look something like this. Here are the NRM or DRM intensities derived from the experiments, different uh, applied field intensities were used and different field inclinations. And we have a systematic decrease of the magnetization in vertical fields. The estimates of relative paleo intensities will follow this trend after normalizing in this case with an ARM normalizer. However, after we apply an inclination correction for the different field intensity, we see that the variation with field inclination is reduced, right? And you can take this as a proof of concept, but it shows that the technique does work. It's labor intensive and it can definitely be improved. For example, going back to Andrea's talk, 
uh, by actually measuring the fabric for the individual subgrain populations and correcting those uh, fabrics and uh, anisotropy corrections, but also the ARM normalizers by the fabric of the specific grain populations. The only uh, drawback with the technique is that it is material limited. So what I mean by this is that we can definitely correct, for example, a stratigraphy, uh, provided that we can collect a large enough number of samples, but we cannot, for example, apply to IODP cores where we don't have enough sample uh, to measure enough fabrics that would give us a, a statistical significance for our corrections. And then lastly, the last thing I want to talk about is simplified inclination corrections. And these have become fairly popular uh, fairly recently or some more recently. I have been talking about them since at least 2008. This is an example I presented at AGU where based on distributions of measured uh, F factors for hematite and magnetite, you're probably familiar with this figure, you can use a mean value to correct the inclination of a rock formation. And I use the example here by Ziderfeld of the SRL red beds, where the red beds are shallow with respect to igneous rocks. And assuming a normal distribution of F, we use the mean value and we fully restore the inclination of the red beds to that of the igneous rocks. But we can also use the minimum and the maximum value of F to provide some confidence bounds around those corrections. Now, it was brought up to my attention that the F vector factor is actually lithology dependent and we should not be using a mean factor. And so the following year, I chose a different experiment to show at AGU. And, uh, and this example uh, was provided in this paper here by Bladalan Kodama, and where I showed that the mean factor, in fact, does not uh, restore the expected inclination, but undercorrects by about 10 degrees. And it is, in fact, the smallest F factor that fully restores the inclination to what's expected. But unfortunately, as I said, these techniques have proven fairly popular, and this seems to be the only thing that really has stuck with the paleomagnetic community. So the question is, where are we at today? Well, we have more data, and so we can determine what the distribution of the shallowing factor is. And clearly, it is not a normal distribution. Uh, the population is heavily skewed. We have a mean that is the same as the median, of about 0.63, and that's great. However, the mode is much smaller than that and would result in higher inclination corrections, which would mean that if we use the average F factor, we would uh, probably undercorrect the majority of our, um, of our rocks. And we can get somewhat more sophisticated with this and separating the F factors for hematite bearing rocks or for magnetite bearing rocks, but the situation really does not improve. Uh, in fact, it gets worse with, uh, and we're moving away from uh, uh, normal distributions here. So I'm going to conclude the talk here and just iterate the same points. High field IRM is the most viable technique we have so far for measuring hematite anisotropy with all the limitations of possibly not saturating, but hopefully we've overcome that, uh, but definitely the limitation of the nonlinearity of the magnetization uh, uh, with the field. Uh, the A factor may be reliably determined by looking at the distribution of the corrected directions and VGPs. We can propagate the error through the correction and it doesn't uh, enlarge our uncertainty confidence ellipses all that much by about all one degree. Um, there's a really good comparison in general between the EI uh, correction technique and the anisotropy technique. So both are viable provided that we have a large enough number of samples and the EI technique does have additional benefits. Although I would argue that uh, just measuring the fabric in a rock has many benefits on itself. Uh, we can use anisotropy corrections to restore and correct for the relative paleo intensity estimates. And I would really hope that uh, these corrections start being applied more routinely. And uh, we cannot uh, apply simplified inclination corrections solely based on the average F factors that we, that we observe. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop here.
and um, me and Ken can start taking some questions. Yes, well, thank you both. Excellent talks and excellent reviews. Uh, do we have, uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, Gunther, do you want it, uh, to speak out your, your own question or yeah. you want me to read it? Of course, of course, I'll Go ahead. speak up. <laughs> thank you both. Uh, I enjoy both of the talks. It's some of my favorite mineral hematite. Uh, question for Ken. Uh, uh, some of the Weiwei uh, work that you showed, uh, there was uh, some porosity reduction transition. And then if I read it correctly, it was between 0.25 to 0.50 kilopascal, which is about quarter to half uh, atmosphere overpressure in the vertical direction. And I wonder how does it relate to lock in depth? Uh, I mean, when you lock in the remnants. Uh, how does it relate to lock in depth? One of the one of the concerns people have had over the years is those are not really high pressures, right? Um, for but what I think you got to look at is a couple of things. What you you've got to look at what that does to the porosity, and what we were trying to look at is how deep. In, in natural marine sediments, you had to get to get the reach the same porosities. And you would get down several hundred meters, um, if I remember correctly. And this was work I did a long time ago, obviously. Um, but the other thing, Gunter, is that the picture of the magnetite needles sticking to the clay particles, I would think that really things are locked in from the from the get-go from the very beginning because the magnetite is either by van der Waals forces or electrostatic uh, attractions tied to the um, the clay particles from the start and in my experiments I, I can't I, I actually did not see the magnetite particles moving around F, from the from the beginning, they were stuck onto them, uh, and Lisa's incorporated that into her model too, of DRM. I think so. I don't know if I answered your question. If I may jump into, I think uh, this question also pertains to the nature of the sediment, and you know if it's clay rich, and then also salinity may play a role. Uh, but if it's very siliciclastic uh, dominated sediment. And again, if inclusions, for example, are present going back to Barbara Marr's work or to more recent work of um, Dave Heslop, Liao Chang and other authors, uh, then the rules of the game will be slightly different and then lock in depth will start playing a more significant role. But marine sediments are typically pretty clay rich. Right. Lisa? Yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I think, I've always been um, impressed by the agreement between our two completely different approaches. So we must be doing something right. But I really like the idea of uh, trying to work on VGPs instead of the in, uh, directions themselves because it's independent of the field model. And, and the field model may not Although we've tested it, you and I did, and we tested it, and it seems to work <laughs> remarkably well, but it doesn't work so well, maybe in the Southern Hemisphere for reasons I don't completely understand. Um, and so just being independent of a field model and going to the VGPs and assuming that they're spherical um, is, uh, is maybe uh, the best next step approach and certainly we could compare all three methods then um uh so i i like that uh dario thank you lisa and all i can say is that i have worked on some brazilian rocks and i've been struggling with remagnetizations there a lot but uh, isolating those sites which i believe carry the primary remnants i was able to correct uh, both using DI technique and the anisotropy technique. Uh, DI technique did tend to undercorrect, but that may have also been between, I had less than 100 specimens, it was uh, about 70s in, in that case. Uh, 
uh, but using the distributions of corrected VGPs, there was a clear minima uh, and that moved the paleopole to closer to where it should have been expected to be. Um, and I take that as a successful correction, though, of course, I don't have anything to really validate that firmly. More specimens. <laughs> More specimens, exactly. Nick, you have a question. Hi, thanks, thanks so much for this uh, the tag, tag, tag team talk. Really enjoyed them. Um, I had a question for Dario related to your presentation of the compilation of F factors and the sort of mm -hmm. reliance on the, on the, on the mode. Um, so I'm just, I guess, I guess just one practical question, mm -hmm. uh, assigning the mode to a population means that you're uh, assigning some precision so that they become discretized values, right? So I'm actually just curious how you're doing that because I wasn't clear in your mm -hmm. IRM quarterly article about it. Um, and then just the, the way you sort of said is that the majority of the time taking the mean or median value would over uh, would under correct, but it would seem that by definition, the median would be taking them. It would be if you take the median that then half the time you'd be uh, correcting the right amount. So anyway, that like sort of more explanation of mm -hmm. how, why you're sort of basing things around mm -hmm. that modal argument. Right. No, and this is sort of a, a work in progress and uh, just an idea that's been at the back of my head for many years and it keeps evolving as more inclination corrected data becomes available and those distributions change. Uh, so it's not quite uh, uh, a firm technique that I have, but I do believe that we should be looking at the distribution of F factors a little bit more closely uh, to try and provide some error bounds uh, around the maximum minimum inclination. Uh, what I mean by uh, mostly under correcting is that there are more samples which have smaller shallowing factors of about 0.45 or whatever it was than there are uh, formations that have shallowing factor of 0.6, right? So if we use the mean of, of 0.6, then the majority of those rock formations will be under corrected. But yes, you, you're right. This is a statistical game we can play in a sense. Yeah, I guess I was just slightly puzzled too in that usually you're sort of used to looking for the mode of a population by looking at the peak of a his histogram where right. the histogram is imposing the discretized units, right? And right. so in how you presented it, you were saying that the mode was lower than the peak of the histogram. Oh, no, no, no. The peak is the mode. The peak is the mode, but the mean okay. is, somewhat, is somewhat higher, yes. Sure. And then... Okay. Right, and then yeah, you can you know plot a histogram in different ways. I used um, you know the bin size as a square root of, of the sample size, which seems to be a fairly uh, standard practice. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. What about shallowing in non-aqueous sediments? We'll still have compaction. We don't have as much dewatering happening, but mm -hmm. if all our grains are stuck to the clays or other particles, it doesn't really matter. What kind yes. of... Well, well, give me an example of a non-aqueous sediment. Aeolian sediment. <laughs> Dune. My only experience here comes into the sedimentary fabrics and the intensity of these fabrics obtained from aqueous and non-aqueous environments. And uh, going back to the work of Taira in 1989, I believe, if not earlier, um, where he managed to obtain and separate the different depositional regimes and the intensity of either the currents or the wind or, or what you will. And... Um, and the results seem to agree fairly nicely between uh, aqueous and non-aqueous environments, though I believe everything was skewed towards the aqueous environments in terms of uh, sample size. Uh, but um, results from uh, natural rocks or redeposited sediments were used there. Uh, and here, uh, of course, he was looking at the depositional fabrics, whether they're bedding compactional or whether they're imbricated. There was no work on inclination shallowing, but I feel it would be very interesting to, um, to look at that too. <laughs> One thing I'd say is I would expect the uncertainties to be larger for Haleian sediments. But... Lisa? Uh, 
I'm not sure if um, Aeolian sediments, the magnetites will be attached to the clays because that, that is determined by the salinity and pH of the water that whether it sticks or not and whether the clays are sticking to each other. And so um, that's, that's an open question whether the, whether the magnetites are just flying through the air without being attached to clays. And that would change everything. <laughs> It would still be an electrostatic attraction, though, between the clay particles yeah. and the, the magnetite. Well, but they, have would, to, they have to connect. Well, anyway. But we would also go back to the anisotropic flattening of uh, non-spherical part particles, right? And whether it's or whether it's rolling of more spherical par particles, and that will still generate inclination shallowing, or it would be mechanical flattening and compaction of anisotropic particles. Right, so the mechanism will be different, but you should still obtain shallowing. I, I don't know, is anybody, I haven't looked at it, but for the less paleomagnetic data, is it shallow? I don't know. We should look at it. Yeah, we, we should look. <laughs> we are looking, but we will look. There's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, there is. We know how old it is. Yep. Yeah. And we know where it is. So, well, the process through the paleosols might be quite uh, quite different, and right, right, should right. expect different answers right. depending. And you you get an offset of the of the, like for example, the Bruns Montsiema boundary mm. is in the wrong place in the list. So in certain sections. In some sections, most I think, very awesome. variable. Yeah, not all of them, but so it might not be a DRM or whatever you call it, flying through the air. Yeah. Any other Thank questions? You. I don't see any hands. Suzanne, do you see anything in the chat? Uh, oh, there's a question. Yep, there's one. Yeah. Great talks. I have two questions. Uh, some scientists prefer to correct the inclinations with the 45 degree IRM method. What's the shortcoming of this method? And so maybe we answer that one and then I'll, I'll say the second question. So if I can jump in, can if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> jump away. <laughs> The only shortcoming that I imagine with that technique is that, so first thing, how does the te technique work? Uh, people have applied ARMs or IRMs at an arbitrary orientation uh, with respect to the sample, and it's typically 45 degrees to bedding. And then they firmly demagnetize that sample and uh, looked at the deflection of the IRM uh, as applied and, and as measured for the coercivity uh, interval of interest as isolated by thermal demagnetization. So this technique really, and then the equate, the shallowing, the deflection of that vector uh, to the shallowing factor. So there's two things. One, um, this correction uh, equates essentially the, the deflection to the F factor as a normal deflection of, of an ARM or a T, TRM, for example, in a natural rock, without considering the, um, uh, the particle anisotropy. And again, going back to Andrea's talk, there are very different processes because uh, when we apply an, a magnetization to a rock that's already lithified, then the the magnetization will rotate within the grains as a function of magnetic coercivity, which will be a function of magnetic anisotropy. But the DRM is acquired differently and the particles enter the system already magnetized and there is nothing impeding these particles to align themselves in the field, except for then subsequent misaligning, misalignment uh, due to mechanical forces, inclination shallowing and whatnot. Uh, so that, there's a first approximation there. Um, and, um, yes, this, and I think that's pretty much it regarding the first question. Maybe this will be the, the last question before we, we break for the second part. So the, the, the other question had to do with the A values.
the distribution of data points in the fitting plot with the A values, how to get the reliable A. Dario, Ken? Well, if you've determined the A factor using different techniques, then of course you can, uh, you, you can compare them and uh, you have a, a sense of confidence in, in the measurements you've obtained. Uh, if you only have the term, if you only determine it through one technique, then even it's based on your experience or whether that technique actually works, uh, or uh, you can try uh, uh, multiple determinations of it. For example, if you find magnetic separates, you can collect many of them. And that technique is not foolproof, right? Because samples will cluster and you will tend to get different results each time. But hopefully there, the mean and the standard deviation will be uh, provide the significant confident bounds on that determination. Uh, for the curve fitting technique and for uh, the distribution correction, then that would mean um, doing multiple studies on the same rock formation. And that of course, it would not be viable, uh, but um, hopefully studies will be reinforced and uh, uh, confirmed by uh, subsequent offers or, um, or just fit a general geological trend with expected uh, inclinations for a region. Okay, well, thank you again, to both of you, Ken and Dario. Max, um, the schedule says that we're supposed to break now.